morning, everyone, and good afternoon and evening for those joining us overseas. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. The topic today will be going native, how to develop native iOS applications with uh, Infragistics Nucleus. My name is Nick Landry. I'm a senior product manager at Infragistics. I'm the product manager for Nucleus. You can reach me via email if you have questions or feedback about the product at activenick at infragistics.com. And uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at ActiveNick. You can read my blog via ActiveNick.net. I'm Brent Schooley. I'm a technical evangelist here at Infogistics, uh, focused on our mobile platforms primarily. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can email me at bschooley, B-S-C-H-O-O-L-E-Y, at Infogistics.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Brent Schooley. Uh, you can follow my blog at Codesnack.com or at bit.ly slash IG Brent. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, the agenda today, is gonna, the webinar is going to last about an hour. We're going to do a very, very quick review of the current mobile ecosystem just to see exactly where Apple in the iOS world fits into mobile devices, both tablet and phones. Um, we're going to talk quickly about how to get started with iOS development. I'm sure there are some of you following this webinar who probably are getting started with iOS development, whereas we probably have others who are experienced iOS developers. We're going to do our best to cater to both groups. But of course, the webinar does assume that you have some knowledge of uh, iOS development. If you don't, we have a number of resources later in the slides that you will be able to, uh, to access on how to get started. And uh, we're also going to post all the slides that you see here this is going to be posted uh, on one of our blogs, probably on my blog. So activenic.net, you can just follow uh, that blog. And uh, before the end of the week, we, should, we get the slides. Um, we're going to cover Nucleus, exactly what, our, what is the product, what controls does it include, what does it do. And we're going to look at development in Xcode with Nucleus and some demos, and also development in Monotouch. And you will see the differences uh, with Nucleus, and we'll see some demos as well. In terms of Q&A, uh, we have two members of the Nucleus team also joining us in a chat room here. So we have uh, Steven Zarek, who is the uh, lead architect for the product. And we also have Tori Betts, who uh, works on product guidance, demos, and documentation for the product. Both are available to answer your questions during the webinar. And then at the end, we can finish with more Q&A over the audio. So the first question that some of you might be wondering, if you're not an iOS developer yet is why would you build iOS apps? We all know how there's over 700,000 apps available today. That's a staggering number. So it can be a little daunting for a new developer to wonder like why should I really jump into that fray with, with such uh, a large set of applications already available? Are there really apps that don't exist yet? And in short, the answer is yes, definitely. There's always room for more, uh, for more apps, for better apps. Uh, yes, there are 700,000 apps. But as we all know, not all of them are of the, the best quality out there. And you always have an opportunity to bubble up to the top. Um, giving you just a quick overview, if we look at the Q3 numbers that just came out, these are actually not um, uh, market share numbers. These are the numbers for Q3 itself. We can see, of course, that Android is still a dominant platform, primarily because it's the new de facto free phone. Whenever you sign up for a new plan, you end up with an Android phone most of the time iPhone is uh, holding a very healthy market share. Uh, Windows Phone is slowly growing. BlackBerry is doing not so well. And the other platforms like uh, Symbian, of course, are, are also in decline, given that more people are switching over from feature phones to smartphones. Some of the key things to remember, though, from the slides, uh, from this slide here is that uh, if we look for the, our listeners in the US, there's actually a lot more iOS uh, than in the rest of the world because it's a platform that's very popular here. Um, Apple has also become one of the top OEMs in the world, something that's quite impressive given that Apple in a smartphone market itself only has uh, premium phones. They don't have cheap phones, free phones. It's all about a premium device and a premium experience. So to be uh, in the top OEMs in the world is actually quite impressive. Um, the other thing also is that iOS is definitely a platform that's hard to ignore. When you look at different companies entering the mobile market, usually, despite the fact that Android is a larger market share, if a company is going to build only one native version first of an app, it's usually going to be the iOS app. 
it, it's the benchmark. It's the the App Store on the, for iTunes is basically the the de facto the standard by which everything else is evaluated. And if we look at app revenue, even though there's a lot more Android users out there, there's more people that buy apps and consume those apps uh, on the iPhone side of things. So in t on the smartphone, you can actually see iOS is leading in terms of app revenue compared to Android. And depending on the various sources you're looking at, it's approximately six to one in terms of the revenue that uh, iOS users are seeing versus Android. And then let's not forget that this is not just about a smartphone. iOS is also a tablet platform. And on the iPad side of things, the iPad still has over 60% of the market. And there's a lot of opportunities there for great tablet applications. So each of you will have their own reasons as to why you would want to build applications for iOS. The bottom line is it's a platform that's here to stay. That's why Infragistics decided to embrace that platform and to bring premium components for developers on iOS. So in terms of getting started with iOS development, so for those of you that are not familiar with what's required, the first thing is you're going to have to get a Mac. There, there's no way around this. To build native applications for iOS, you need to do this on a Mac computer. This is not a technical limitation on, on our part or anybody else's. It's basically an Apple decision. The tools only work on a Mac. And there's, not, there's no easy way to set up virtual machines uh, to run on Windows. It's mostly just hacks, so it's not something that we recommend. Just get a Mac computer. You can get a used Mac if you don't have one on eBay or on other uh, secondhand uh, sources. And there's also great platforms you can get. For example, you can get an, a brand new Mac Mini for less than $1,000. So the second thing is you'll have to register an account at developer.apple.com. Um, this is not something that's going to cost you money right away. You can get a free registered account, but if you want to be able to deploy apps to an actual device and then submit an app to a store, then you will need to pay the $99 a year that comes with that subscription. The beauty is that this is a one-time fee that you pay for the year, and it gives you access to deploying apps for both the, the iPad but also the iPhone. The next thing is you'll have to install Xcode which is available in the Apple Mac Store. So whenever you, on your Mac, you, you have a store just like you have a store that's available on iOS. In this store, you will find Xcode. Xcode is the IDE, the development environment. For those of you that are, for example, more familiar with the Microsoft world, it would be the equivalent to Visual Studio. Uh, for those of you that do Java development, it would be kind of like your Eclipse. So Xcode is the IDE from Apple to do iOS development. And then, of course, uh, the next step would be to download and install Nucleus. Nucleus is our set of controls that are native from Infragistics for iOS development. And you can access the product page at infragistics.com slash iOS. And we have a free evaluation, so you can get started today without spending a dime and play with the controls. So Infragistics, as many of you know, we've been in the business of supporting Microsoft developers for over 20 years now. Uh, we have controls that that are available on multiple platforms, but we go beyond just uh, Windows. We, we cover smartphone devices, including Windows Phone, but beyond the Microsoft world, we also have the best HTML5 and jQuery controls with our new uh, Ignite UI product. And in the mobile world, because it's a very fragmented world, we knew that we couldn't just support the Microsoft side of things. It was important to support those other platforms. That's why we have Nucleus, which is our new set of native controls for iOS developers. And we also have Iguana UI, which is our community pack for native Android developers. So what is Nucleus? Nucleus basically is native controls for iOS developers. It is not something that allows you to uh, reuse, for example, WPF controls and use them on a Mac. This is for native iOS developers. So if you use a Mac with Xcode and Objective-C, this is for you. This is something that's been designed specifically for the experience of the Apple developer. Uh, our first release was actually last month in October 2012, and this is a new product that we are very hard working on. And um, we already have a new release that's going to come in 13.1 around the March-April timeframe. We have a full team dedicated to the product, and it, it is a first-class citizen here at Infragistics. One of the first controls that's usually highly requested in any suite of controls for any platform is the data chart. So what we've done is we've drawn inspiration from 
our uh, award-winning data chart on the XAML side of things. And we're offering 22 data chart types, the ability to do composite charting. We have trend line support, data markers, legends. You'll get to see a lot of these things in the demos today. We'll, drive, we'll dive into uh, some of the details. But it supports a lot of advanced features like inertial zooming and panning in real time. We have extremely fast performance. You can have over a million data points and still get like excellent performance on uh, an iPhone or especially an iPad. We also have support for our motion framework, which you'll get to see in one of the demos today, which allows you to show data transitions over time that are smoothly animated. And the next control that is always highly requested is the grid, or as it's called in our, in our suite here, the IG grid view. Grids are basically the bread and butter of all enterprise developers. You can build applications with and, and bind to a lot of data. We've actually uh, created uh, some, some great features in here, like a data class helper that allows you to bring some paradigms from the .NET world, like data binding, and attach that to our iOS grid. The grid can be used in, in kind of like in two approaches. It can be used as a, as a data grid, a straight grid if you will bind to your data, whether it's coming from files, from XML files, or from a uh, database. And then you can also use it as a layout tool itself. It's a very powerful tool. It allows you to lay out data in a grid. It could also be a single column list or a single row list as well. So it's definitely a very powerful control that can be styled and template to look like virtually almost anything that you can imagine. And you'll get to see a lot of examples here. If you want to play with all this, so it's something you can actually try right now. If you have an iPhone, if you have an iPad, and I would definitely recommend getting one of either uh, for development because even though there's the simulator included with Xcode, it's usually a good idea to also test with a real device. If you want to see the controls in action, uh, you can actually go and download our sample browser today. It's free. It's available on the iTunes store. Just go to bit.ly slash IGIOSSB. And it, this will redirect you to the iTunes App Store page for the Nucleus sample browser. And from there, you'll be able to explore the various samples we've created for you. Um, there's some advanced samples. There's some basic ones that show the various features in the product. And for each and one of those, at the bottom right, you've got that little curly sheet you can click so that you can see what the code behind looks like for uh, all of these demos. So let's get started. And so, oh yeah, that's true. So let's actually take a look at the, uh, so let me go back here and we'll give you a quick demo of the sample browser and what it looks like because you do get the source code to the sample browser directly with the installer. So Brent? Okay, yeah, I just wanted to give you guys a, a brief overview of what's in the sample browser, uh, the types of things you can expect to see there, uh, what types of samples, what types of support, these sorts of things that, that are available. Uh, so when you, when you first launch the sample browser, you're going to get a lot of these uh, experiences, sort of just a, a quick view that you can, you can drill in and take a look at uh, some of these samples. This is a, a photo browser that actually uses our grid control. So on the left-hand side, you've got a bunch of thumbnails. That's a grid. And on the right-hand side, you've got the photos themselves. That's another grid. So as I select photos on the left-hand side, oh, as I select photos on the left-hand side, they're loaded in the grid on the right. We also have a splitter, so we can control the, the size here. So that, that's one, one kind of creative way that you could use a grid. Uh, we do have uh, some more traditional views, obviously, for this type of thing. Uh, this is showing our chart control as well. Uh, and we can look at different types of ways of visualizing data. Uh, if you want to get really creative with layout, uh, this is kind of like the bookshelf view that you might be familiar with seeing on iOS. Uh, this is accomplishable with, with the grid control as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you some of the techniques that are involved with that later in the webinar. But as we tap an item, we can get details uh, kind of like you might expect. Uh, so these are sort of what I would consider uh, sort of features, so you, uh, showcase features, so you can kind of get a view of how these things might look in an actual application. But we also have, for each of the controls, we have these sets of features that you can you can drill into and, and sort of see the different use cases that you, you might do in your application. So for the chart, we have uh, examples of what motion framework might look like. So you can animate points around your chart. Um, you can 
you can programmatically stop or start that. You can zoom in on certain areas of the chart and things will still continue to move around. Uh, we have different chart types. So this is showing a bunch of different types of series. So we can toggle between those, refresh the data. So it's showing a bar series. We have column series, line series, et cetera. There, as Nick mentioned, there's, there's many types of charts that you can use here. Uh, we also have the, the grid view, uh, similar set of features, the feature type overview where you can uh, drill around and see the different types of things that are supported uh, for, for the grid view. Uh, like we can pull in, we can do some filtering uh, on this. We can also do cell reordering. So as I, as I reorder, things will shift around. Uh, we can do deletion. So if we select some cells here and delete, they'll animate into place. These, are, these things are all easy to set up on the grid view. And I, I will show some of these when we get to demos later in the webinar. Uh, you also have access from the samples browser to the forums for the product. So that's a nice convenient thing, um, as well as documentation. So it's a good way to sort of explore before you even download the product. Um, I didn't show, but on, on each of these samples, there's a little page curl in the bottom right that if you tap it will actually show you the, the code for that individual sample. So that, that's just a quick look at uh, the sample browser. I also want to show it's not just uh, for the iPad, but we also have support for this on the phone. So it's the same sample browser. It's the same exact experience that you had there just on the phone. All right, thanks, Brent. So now let's start digging into those controls. I'll give you a quick overview of the features for each control. And then after that, Brent is going to show you an actual demo on how you would go about building with those inside of Xcode using Objective-C. Um, the first one is the grid or the IG grid view. The grid, as I said before, is basically a powerful grid that can be used either as an advanced data grid to bind to your data and then manipulate it in your app, or it can be used also as a layout tool that's extremely powerful so you can have interactions with, uh, with the data and then you can change how the layout and how the, uh, the, the, the information is going to be moved around in terms of rows and cells. So some of the key features we have in here, and you'll get to see them in action in both the sample browser but also in some of the demo, is the ability to use a context menu. So the tap and hold uh, paradigm where you can just tap and hold on, on a cell or a row and then show a pop-up menu. And then from there, you can program which actions would be available to your user. We have a data source helper that basically allows you to connect to your data source and then use uh, the data binding principles to connect your grid to your data. We also uh, support row insertion and deletion. Everything is animated, so whenever you insert a row, you will see all the other rows that's underneath smoothly move down to make room for the new row. If you delete a row, it's going to be the same thing. You remove it, and then it, it, animations are going to kick in to show you how the row disappears, and then the other rows will move up to accommodate. We support filtering so that you can search by certain columns, certain cells uh, in your grid. Uh, you can also use grouping so that whenever you want to group data together by uh, one of the columns in terms of data. The famous pull to refresh, which was created by Apple, so that if you have a list of data and you want to refresh data based on a data source, then a user can then simply do a pull down gesture on the grid, and then you'll get a little animation at the top. And then this is going to raise the proper event so that you can go and load the data that you need. Uh, you can uh, reorder rows and cells, just like Brent demonstrated in the sample browser. Uh, we also have a, a scrolling shortcut so that you have the ability at, on the right side to have this bar that can allow you to uh, quickly show the various categories of data like groups and then you can quickly scroll. So for example, you can have a list where even if you have hundreds or thousands of, row, of rows in there, you could show the letters from A to Z and then you could quickly jump to a letter by scrolling in there. And so there's a lot of different features in a grid like this. You can select items in a grid. You've got star sizing on columns. You can sort, of course, the information in your grid directly in the display. And there's very advanced styling that is available in this grid. So just to show you some quick examples that come from the sample browser of what a grid can look like. So this is right here, our grid uh, being used to, to create a, a Twitter client. You've got all this code in our sample browser. Uh, 
Uh, here it's actually showing the shortcut bar. And then you have filtering, for example, all the names that start with an H. Um, you can use it to create a photo album like this, for example. So the grid can be used as a single column um, list right here where all the photos are displayed. Or it could also be at the bottom like this where you have two rows of uh, images and then you can select to create a photo album. So these are all different ways that a grid can be used. There's the, the movie shelf uh, example that Brent showed you in a sample browser. And then finally, you can also combine controls together. Like for example, here we have a grid where each row contains a photo, some additional information and data, but also each row contains an actual data chart that binds to the information related to the person that's listed here. So you can use both controls together, and that's something that's going to keep going as well as we introduce more and more controls. The uh, controls are easy to use together, and we're going to have more examples to show you how to do this. So now let me turn it over to Brent again, who is now going to give you a demo on how to build applications with Nucleus Grid using Objective-C and Xcode. All right, so the number one suggestion that I would have for those of you that are, are not familiar yet with Objective-C coding is uh, you're going to see a lot of square brackets. I would suggest ignoring them for now and just read the code as if they're not there. Uh, as you become familiar with Objective-C, you, you may or may not get used to those. But um, I'm not going to show the header file for most of the samples because most of them look like this. What we're declaring is a grid view control and a grid view data source helper. So it's just a couple lines of code that gets the set up in the header. Uh, I won't I won't show the header in other samples un unless there's a, a difference. So for your view controllers in an iOS application, uh, the, the event that's going to run when your screen loads is the view did load. And you're going to add some code here to set up your view. And what's important to look at here is uh, where we're setting up the grid view. So we're setting up a grid view control here and setting it to be the width and height of the, uh, the view for this view controller, and setting it so that it will expand in uh, the width and height if the orientation changes. That's what the auto resizing mask does. Uh, the next line of code here just hides the header, the, the grid view header at the top, because uh, we don't need it for this sample. Uh, and then we're basically setting up here that we have some columns that we're going to display. Uh, and that, that being the image here. Um, so basically what you're going to do when you set up your data is this line up here, the, the salesman item, just generates uh, 100 items that we can display in our grid. Uh, then we, we basically set up the data source helper to use that set of data. And we can set up columns that we want to display with certain types. And down here is where we actually assign that data to the data source. And we're setting that we're going to group the data on territory. Uh, up here, we've ignored certain columns on iPhone. That's just because there's, there's less room to display there. So we're not going to display all the columns there. But simply setting up this data source and attaching it as the data source to the grid view is going to give us a, a sectioned uh, grid, basically a data grid that's grouped by territory. So if we run this sample in the samples browser and pull up the simulator, and then drill into the grid, and we are looking at sections. So you'll notice as we change the uh, orientation of the grid, it automatically resizes. That was that resizing mask that we specified earlier. Uh, we have 100 sales items in here. I'm not going to count them all, but we set up 100 salesmen. And they're grouped by their territory. And that's automatically created sections for you and automatically laid out the different properties as columns in here. Uh, the only thing we had to set up there was the, the image property. Uh, so that's that's the sections. Uh, that's how you can set sec set up sectioned uh, sectioned grid. Uh, wanted to look at briefly the uh, row reordering because it's just a a, a really simple thing to enable. Uh, so we have here basically the same code that we used before to set up our uh, sectioned grid view. 
And then we just set a property on here that says row reordering equals yes, which will turn on row reordering uh, for this sample. So if we come back and look for uh, row reordering, uh, what we end up getting here instead uh, is this on the far right column, we can just simply reorder. And that was just one property that we needed to set there. Uh, we don't have the territory section here, but we could add that back fairly easily if we wanted to. Uh, but that's just one property that you set on the grid view, and it gives you uh, this reordering that you'd expect on iOS. Uh, one more pretty interesting example that I wanted to show you is uh, this concept of showing a a set of images similar to what we saw in the bookshelf. And uh, what we're going to use for that is what's called single field multiple rows. What we're going to set up here, we're going to get our same salesman uh, items that we did before. So that's going to give us the image that we can use that's going to show a picture, a headshot for each of the salesmen. Uh, but when we set up the, the data source this time, we're going to use what's called a single field multi-column data source helper. So what that's going to allow us to do is create multiple columns using one single field. And what we're going to use in this case is that image property uh, up here. So we set up that image column. When we set up the multi-column data source helper, we're going to initialize it with that column, with that image column. And when we say that we want four columns, that means every row is going to have four images in it. And then it's going to repeat over the data source. So if we go back to our sample browser here, uh, we can do that here. So as I said, every row has four images here, and it repeats over the data source. So that's just going to use that image column to repeat this data for as many objects as you've assigned in that data source. So again, it's really simple to set these things up. We have a variety of data sources that ship with the product, and they're, they're fairly simple to set up. Just in this case, you just pass a column and set the number of columns that you want to display per row and, and run it. There's, there's a similar one that'll do a, a single, single row. So that's using another data source um, to, to display them in a, in a single row in this case. But uh, that's just a, a couple of the samples that, that ship with the samples browser with the product and uh, a little brief overview of the code. All right, thanks, Brent. So that was the IG grid view. Let's now take a quick look at our chart. Uh, the data chart is actually uh, kind of like the one we have uh, available already for uh, XAML, like including WPF and Silverlight, and also on jQuery. Um, it includes a subset of the chart series that we have today. Uh, we will be adding more of those. Today, it already supports a very impressive number of series. So. The base category series include things like area, spline area, bar column, line, line, step area, step line, waterfall, and point. We also have the range category series, including the range area, range column. Scatter series include scatter and bubble. And we, of course, support, we, since we have a very high number of customers already in a financial world, uh, whether it's in banks or investment banks or in the world of insurance, or and of course, it could be used for any kind of um, of application that deals with financial data, we support uh, two types of financial series uh, in, in candlestick and open, high, low, closed mode. But we also have financial indicators. And today we have five financial indicators. We are adding a lot more in the next version to match the 34 financial indicators that we already have on the XAML side of things. And of course, for scientific applications, we support three types of polar uh, charts and also three types of radial charts. So, of course, there's other features in the chart, like trend lines. We have different markers that can be used. Um, we have the motion frame rate that's supported, so Brent is going to be able to demo some of those. You can see them in action in a sample browser, but now, um, just to give you a quick idea, so this is an example of a candlestick financial series with trend lines. The beauty of our chart also is that it supports composite charting, so you can have, add multiple series. So you can have one candlestick, one financial, uh, you, you can have uh, bars, you can have different lines, all on the same chart. So you don't have to overlay multiple charts for this. Each chart supports multiple series. So this is an example of our um, of our radial series uh, in pi mode. And then we also have, for example, right here, uh, an area series with a trend line. And here it's bar uh, columns, rather, uh, with a trend line. 
and these are all animated also in a sample browser. And these are examples of what our chart can look like even on older phones. For example, these are screenshots that were captured on an older iPhone 3GS. So in terms of iOS versions that you need for Nucleus, we support iOS version 4.3 and up. And so that means that you, you can reach a very wide range of users out there so that not everybody has upgraded to uh, 5.0 or 6.0 in terms of iOS, but we do fully support iOS 5 and iOS 6, including some of the new features as well. Same example here with a financial series as displayed on a simple iPhone 3GS. So now I'll turn it over to Brent again, who's going to dig into uh, chart development with Nucleus. Okay, so as we switch over to the chart, we're going to take a look at uh, a very similar basic example sort of thing. We're not going to dig into too many details here. Uh, you can dive in and, and go very deep with this stuff uh, on your own, but I just wanted to give you a, a quick, quick look at um, some of the series that we have available. Um, so we're going to we're going to focus on the, the category series. This is a, a sample, obviously, that you can get in the sample browser. Uh, just taking a quick look at the, the header file in this one, uh, we have enumeration that shows a, a variety of the different category series that we have as options here. Uh, we see that we have a category series data source helper and a high-low data uh, source helper that will be used for some of the range-based uh, series that we'll have in here. But for the most part, what we're what we're concerned with here is the infra or the IG chart view, which we'll call infra chart in this uh, code sample. Coming back over to the view controller, uh, there is a lot of code in this sample uh, towards the bottom that deals with setting up the data. Um, for the purposes of this talk, we're not going to dig into it, but basically it creates uh, 100 random numbers, uh, and you can refresh that data uh, from within the chart. Uh, just taking a, a quick look at what this what this sample looks like over here before we start talking about it, um, we have this category series chart type sample, which is what we're going to be working with. So as I've mentioned, you, it's going to generate 100 data points, and you have the option to, to refresh the data here, and it'll animate into place. Uh, you can flip through the different uh, series types that we have. So we have area, we have bar, column, line, point, uh, all of these support animation as well. Uh, spline area, spline series, uh, step area series, step line series, uh, range area, range column, waterfall. So we can, we can actually look at the code that was uh, used to generate this sample in this uh, IG category series view controller. To come up to view did load, uh, the chart types array is just setting up uh, the names for all of the different series that we have. Uh, if, we, if we move down, this is where the, the data is being set up and then it's populated in this populate data method. As I mentioned, that's just going to generate some, some random numbers. Setting up the chart, very similar to the last one, we're going to have flexible width and height. That's what allows us to be able to rotate and resize without having to worry about it. And then we're going to set up the series. So uh, by default, we're going to set up an area series. So we're going to add, add a series for type IG area series uh, using a key area series with the data source source that we set up before that's got our uh, random numbers. And we're going to have a first axis named X axis and a second axis named Y axis. Uh, we hide the x-axis labels by setting the labels visible to no. And we can configure some properties on the y-axis, such as the minimum and maximum, uh, just by setting, setting simple properties on, on the axes. The transition duration for this series uh, is being set to one second here. That is the duration that the animations will run uh, as we're refreshing data in the, in the series. Uh, and then the frame. Uh, on, in iOS, the frame is just the, the boundaries for the control, um, the, the, the rectangle that it's going to occupy on the screen. So we're just setting that to be the size of the container that it's in, uh, and then giving it a little inset so that uh, it's got a little bit of padding around it. Uh, we set the theme here to the dark theme. We have uh, a couple of themes available, and uh, the chart's very customizable to, to meet the needs uh, for your particular branding 
uh, needs in this case. But that's the, the basic code to get up and running with the area series. So this, this code here that we've looked at so far is enough to do the, the chart that's here plus the, the refresh button. Uh, the code for the refresh button is kind of interesting to look at uh, down here. So what that's going to do is, is regenerate the data, basically, and replace each element in the chart's data source uh, with the new data that was generated. So, so when you do that, if you've got the animation uh, duration set, that's going to animate that change. So basically, you'll, you'll want to replace the, the objects in your data source and then replace, call this replace item at index with source uh, as you loop through. And that, that'll animate uh, the changes for you. Uh, another thing that we had was the, the buttons to change the series. So for each, each case in here, we're setting up a new series. So we've got the range area series, the range column series. And we're setting similar properties on that uh, as we did for the area series. Uh, and then just basically adding that uh, to the chart uh, and, and updating it so that so that that'll be the, the new series that the chart's displaying. Uh, so that, that's, that's the basic way to get up and started with uh, using uh, the chart, uh, how to configure series, how to set up properties on it, and get it up and running in your okay, place. Thanks, Brent. Um, by the way, we are trying to figure out exactly if we have an issue with questions because it Either none of you have any questions so far, which we find uh, unlikely, or maybe the questions are only available um, via the presenter view. So let's just see here. Do we have any questions? Yeah, we do have questions. So we apologize because right now the questions are only visible on the presenter computer. So what we'll do is uh, we will save those questions for the Q&A at the end, and then um, we can follow up afterwards with uh, information on the blog and maybe answer some of the questions on the blog post when we post the slides if we don't have time to cover them all in the Q&A. So I'll just continue for now. We have your questions right here. We can see them. It's just that unfortunately, uh, Steve and Tori right now cannot see your questions, which is why they have not been answering them uh, just yet. OK? So let's continue for now. Um, OK, we're getting some notifications here. Let's just, OK. Um, the next part we're going to cover is a lot of people sometimes wonder, like, okay, but I don't really know how Objective-C works, um, so I would like to know, can I use another language? Can I use C-sharp? And there is an answer to this, which is, yes, you can use C-sharp if you want to build native iOS applications. There is a product called Monotouch by Xamarin. So you can simply go to xamarin.com slash monotouch, and then you can use their tools to create cross-platform applications, and these are going to be native applications. You're still going to need a Mac, because Monotouch is still going to run on a Mac for this, but at least it allows you to, you to reuse some of the C-sharp code that you have, and then you can create these cross-platform libraries, but then you're still going to have to create the UI specifically for iOS. The way it works is that you can import, for example, existing .NET libraries and use them in your Monotouch apps, and uh, you can uh, bind existing C and Objective-C libraries as well. Uh, Xcode, it, it works with uh, Xcode 4 and the UI designer, so it fully integrates with it. And the way that it works whenever you want to use third-party controls like Nucleus inside of Monotouch is you need to use some bindings. So every control that needs to be wrapped for a Monotouch application need, needs to, to supply its own bindings, and we are actually supplying some bindings for you. So when you install the Nucleus product, you will have a folder called Monotouch, and in this you will find the binding files that are required to use the IG Grid view in the chart as well uh, inside of a Monotouch project. These bindings are still in beta today because we are still seeking feedback from the community in terms of uh, converting the API to something that would be more friendly to C-sharp developers, and uh, our plan is to release the bindings in final form over the next few months. But so far, we already have a, um, we, whoops, sorry, we just lost this. Okay, we're trying to answer some questions. So we already um, have beta bindings today. You can use them. You can build applications with it. And we also have a blog post that I'm going to include as a link at the end where Brent uh, is walking you through how to use Monotouch. But for now, instead of waiting for this, 
Brent is going to give you a demo on how to use um, Monotouch and C Sharp with the Nucleus controls. All right, guys. So for those of you that are familiar with C Sharp, this will uh, look a little more familiar to you in terms of uh, language syntax and, and features. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out uh, was that where you'll find the, uh, the DLLs that you need, uh, if we go to folder here and go to slash developer, uh, you'll find that we have an infragistics folder. It's got a nucleus folder. And in here there's monotouch. And in there you'll find the IG DLL that you'll use for the grid and the chart view DLL uh, that you can use for the chart control. Uh, inside of monotouch, once you've got your uh, project loaded up, you can go to references. And what you're going to want to do here is edit the references and add uh, .NET assembly uh, browse to that location on disk where the, the DLLs were and add it to your project. I've already gone ahead and added the, the chart view DLL here and we're going to use that to, to create basically the same chart uh, chart series example that we just looked at in the sample browser before. Uh, we're just going to do it in C Sharp using Monotouch this time. Um, so basically the, the differences that you're going to have uh, when you're developing with Monotouch versus Objective-C uh, is that a lot of the, the code that required header and implementation files is all found in one uh, C Sharp class, uh, which is our view controller class. And basically, we're going to set up the same, the same type of data that we had before. We're going to have the high load data. We're going to have uh, chart view as we did before. Uh, and we're going to have the random number generator with some code that can generate 100 points. And we're going we're gonna to go ahead and we're going to get this chart set up. and uh, so we, we, we declare objects the way we would expect to in C Sharp. You can, you can create a, a new chart view um, using a constructor. You're going to set properties like you're familiar with in C Sharp. Uh, you're, you're always going to use this property syntax as opposed to what you would see in Objective-C with the, the square bracket message calling. Uh, but we can set up the series type, the series name, the y-axis name, and the x-axis name. Uh, these are going to use NS strings, which that's a, a holdover from Objective-C. It's just something that we require for the platform right now, uh, that you'll create these NS string classes as opposed to C-sharp strings. Uh, but, but you're going to pass those in to the chart. Uh, it's got a method called add series for type using key with data source, first axis key, second axis key. And you're going to pass in those parameters to, to add the chart. It's very similar to what we did in Objective-C. We're just doing it in C-sharp. We're going to set the same properties, turn off the x-axis labels. We're going to set the minimum and maximum on the y-axis as we did before. And we can set the transition duration as we did before. Again, it's, it's all very similar to what we just did in Xcode, uh, but in a syntax that might be more familiar to the C-sharp developer. Uh, I, I showed the refresh button in the Xcode project just to show you uh, that it was there. Uh, there's a way to hook that up in, in Xcode that's a little bit different than the way we would hook that up in C-sharp. In C-sharp, we have access to this refresh button that I created in our view uh, because when we edited the view file uh, in Xcode, you actually edit the, uh, the views. You can edit them in Xcode. And I added a, a refresh button over there and created what's called an outlet to it. And that makes it available in my monotouch code as just a property on our view controller. So I come back over, what I'm doing is I'm adding an event handler to the clicked event for the button, which is something that you're probably familiar with from your .NET coding. Uh, and all we're doing here is the same, same type of code that we did before, where we're going to regenerate the random numbers and replace the objects in the data source, and then replace the items at index on the chart which is going to animate the points, just like it did over in Xcode. If we run this sample here, we'll end up with a, a basic version. I, this only supports the area series. I didn't do all of the, uh, the different series that we have, but you'll, you'll see that we just, have, <coughs> we just have the area series in the chart. When we click Refresh, it's going to automatically regenerate the points, just like it did over in Xcode. But again, this is using uh, C Sharp, which may or may not be more familiar to. So finally, uh, beyond the current release, so for 2012 release of Nucleus is basically our very first 
uh, initial offering for native iOS development. We are still we are already hard at work on the 13.1 release, which will come around March or April of 2013. So just to give you a good idea of what are our goals, our design goals for the product moving in the future. Uh, first of all, our goal is to have full parity, especially around data visualization controls across all of our platforms. So that includes our shared SAML platform, which covers WPS and Serverlite, HTML5 and jQuery with our Ignite UI product, iOS with Nucleus. Uh, we have WinRT controls that are coming for both XAML, C Sharp, and also for uh, WinJS. That includes also Windows Phone, which does have most of these controls already today, and also our Android platform, which has a set of charts and will be investing to bring you more controls on Android with Iguana UI. Uh, some of the new controls that you will see in Nucleus 13.1, of course, all of this is subject to change, so don't quote me on that, but we are working on bringing you some radial gauges. We have the pie chart, which, was, uh, which is a highly requested control. We also have a rich text label, and we have a few more surprises that might come that uh, I don't want to spill the beans too early. But we're not just going to bring you new controls. We're also bringing you new features in some of the existing controls that we have. So for example, the grid will support things like column resizing by the user, uh, fixed columns, reordering of columns, uh, infinite scrolling. We also will give you a better way to theme the grid because today, while you have a lot of flexibility on how you can theme it, we want to make sure that it's going to be easier for you to do it with less code. On the chart side of things, we, we cover 22 chart series today. We have over 40 with our XAML product. So we want to bring you basically every chart series that we support on XAML. We want it to be supported uh, on the chart on iOS. So that includes some of the stack series that are not available today. We have more radial series options, scatter spline, polar spline, and polar spline area. More financial indicators. We have already over 29 financial indicators that we're adding for 13.1. So this is really exciting because the existing controls today are becoming much more powerful. And then finally, today our monotouch bindings are considered to be beta. We will make sure that we have final monotouch bindings, not just for the current controls, but also for the new controls that will ship inside of 13.1. Uh, in terms of the next steps, so, um, by the way, there was one thing that I did not mention. It was answered in the chat. Somebody was asking how much is the product. Uh, our introduction price for this product is actually $4.95 US for Nucleus. Uh, it's actually much cheaper than most of our other products that are available today. Uh, we have, this is including our standard support option. If you want uh, something a little cheaper and you're willing to forego the standard support, we have a community edition at $2.95 US which basically gives you forum support only, but you don't have phone or email support through it. If you want a premium support like we have, then it's $9.95 for Nucleus with premium support. Uh, to get started, register a new account at developer.apple.com if, you if you're not already an Apple developer. Install Xcode, download Nucleus at infragistics.com slash iOS. And then um, if you want to learn a little more about iOS, Apple does have some getting started videos at developer.apple.com slash video slash iOS you can look at. There's also all the Worldwide Developer Conference, which is Apple's develop yearly developer conference. It was mostly around the new iOS 6, uh, and these are all videos that date back from June, but all of, of them are, of course, still relevant because they discuss the current iOS 6, iOS 6 which has been available since September. Uh, Pluralsight is a good partner of Infragistics, offers some iOS training. Uh, not all of them are fully up to date to the latest, latest iOS 5 or 6, but you can just go to pluralsight.com slash training slash courses uh, pound iOS. And then um, I have assembled a, a, a list of Twitter bloggers, uh, of Twitter, um, basically people on Twitter that blog about iOS and discuss iOS. So you can just follow me at twitter.com slash activenick. And my list is at uh, slash iOS-dev-bloggers. Uh, some recommended learning references, whether you're a beginner in iOS development or an experienced developer, uh, the experienced developers, I'm sure, will agree with some of the recommendations here. The, the big nerd ranch guides are by far the best iOS books you can get. There is one on iOS programming. There's also one on Objective-C programming, which goes deeper into the language itself. Um, we have a good friend of ours, Josh, Josh Smith, who's also 
uh, an excellent logistics guy, has written an iOS programming guide for .NET developers. So if you're already a .NET developer and don't know iOS, this is also a good book you can get in addition to the Big Nerd Ranch guide. Uh, I also personally like the Beginning iOS Development, Exploring the iOS SDK from A Press. There's, of course, a lot of other great books. You can go to Barnes & Noble or Amazon or other online stores and look at the reviews there. But these are just a few to help you get started. Um, if you want, if you have an iPad, uh, you can also go to iBooks. It works on iPhone, but of course it's a little small to read. Uh, Apple does have a number of free iBooks you can download. So all the books you see here on the shelf are free uh, iBooks. Unfortunately, those are a little dated now because most of them were uh, uh, around um, iOS 4, if I remember correctly. So, but it should still give you a good starting point because a lot of these principles are still true, especially when it comes to the uh, Objective C or the Cocoa Fundamentals Guide. And then finally, uh, if you want to read a little more about all of this, uh, I highly recommend that you follow uh, Steve Z, who is basically our lead architect on Nucleus here at Infragistics. So I've got shortened URLs here on where you can find his blog. He's already really posted a long series uh, that's up to six or seven uh, entries so far around uh, Nucleus, which allows you to understand how to move from C Sharp to Objective C if you're a .NET developer. Um, Brent also published a great post, uh, part one of his Monotouch series on how to use the uh, IG chart view. And then uh, if you want to get a quick overview of what we've discussed in the webinar, I've posted on my blog a post that covers the high-level features of the product, which is on uh, Nucleus itself, and that's the third one right here. So at this point, uh, we'll just jump into Q&A. We have about seven minutes left into the um, into the, uh, the webinar. So what it will do is uh, Steve and Tori uh, are going to continue answering questions, and I'll just go through some of the Q&A directly that's been posted here just to give a quick answer uh, to people right here. Remember to follow Brent and I on Twitter, at ActiveNick and at Brent Schooley. You can also contact us at our emails right here that are visible on screen. These are mainly for Q&A around the webinar, around the product that's being discussed here. Uh, if you need support on the product, please go to the forums. Uh, we have forums on these products, so that's the best place to ask your questions. So some of the questions that have been asked so far. Um, so how much does it cost? As I said, this is 4.95 USD US dollars for the su standard support edition, 2.95 for the community edition, which is forum support only, and 9.95 for the premium support. Um, so do you still need to develop an Objective C with Nucleus? Nucleus is a product for native iOS development. So then we're not changing any of the rules. So yes, you will be building on a Mac with Xcode and Objective-C. However, if you want to use Monotouch to do C-sharp development, you also can with the bindings that are provided with the Nucleus installer. However, you will still need a Mac for this. For those of you that have had either joined late or had issues with the, um, the audio or something, you had the availability, uh, availability of uh, dial-in numbers or uh, voice over IP, we are recording the webinar. We will be posting it. So just follow my blog, uh, activenic.net, and I will make sure to create a blog post uh, over the next couple days that will include the slide deck that you've seen here and also the, um, the a, a link to the recording on where you can uh, listen to this webinar at a later date. Um, OK. So I heard that there are Monotouch bindings available. Do you have any Monotouch example projects available? So we don't have any uh, samples on Monotouch directly in a sample browser. It's something we're going to try to rectify for 13.1. However, Brent has already created a nice post about this. So just go to Brent's blog, which is, um, if you go to the Infragistic community, you'll find it. You can also follow Brent Cooley on Twitter, and you'll find the proper links to his blog. So he's got, and on the, the, the blog page, there was already a link there on where you can find the Monotouch post. It does include sample code on how to get started with Monotouch. And Brent is also going to continue a series with at least one more post on the chart. And then after that, you know, depending on popularity and requests, you can also send um, requests to Brent on which areas of Monotouch you'd like to see in a blog post. Uh, can we connect to an existing SQL Server database to show data in a grid, even though we are using a Mac to develop this app? So currently, binding to SQL Server isn't available. 
you can create a web application to interface with the SQL Server and output the necessary format that you can consume through iOS. Uh, do we have other questions, guys? I don't see any more questions posted here. Sorry? Okay. So we still have four minutes left. So feel free to ask your questions if you have any. Again, you can contact me at ActiveNick on Twitter. You can also contact Brent Schooley at Brent Schooley on Twitter. Uh, you can reach us via email if you have follow-up questions about this. Okay, so I think, uh, so we have a question here on any performance issues with Monotouch and C Sharp. So we don't, we don't have any in-house performance testing numbers that uh, we can share just yet. We don't, we haven't seen really any issues on performance there with uh, Monotouch. It's still native. Brent, you have anything you want to comment there? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's very similar to what you'd expect to see when you're using Monotouch just in general. We're, we're not, you're not going to see a, perform, a big noticeable performance implication uh, using our product in Monotouch. It's very similar to the, the rest of that platform. You do have some overhead in the fact that you are running mono on the phone or on the iPad, but uh, in general, it's it's not something that you're you're going to notice. It's not something that your users are going to notice. Yeah, and you remember that our our controls here at Infragistics are always designed with performance in mind. So we push the envelope a lot when it comes to performance and especially scalability as well. To us, scalability and performance are not mutually exclusive. You can still get great performance even when you have massive amounts of data, whether it's the number of rows in your grid or the number of points in a data chart. And Xamarin also produces great quality products. They also make sure that uh, the overhead is as little as possible for the mono platform. So you're going to get the best performance possible using the two products together. So do we have any other questions, guys? So can you show the page with the iOS books you suggested? So OK, sure. We can go back to a few of the, the pages here. That's the free um, iBooks. And then uh, maybe show the previous one with the links, uh, well, the, the one with the, the other, the, this one with the iOS books. These are by far the best books we can recommend right now. Um, I'm sure if my colleagues, if they have different recommendations, they can all, you can ask them on Twitter and they can, uh, Steve, what's your uh, Twitter handle? Uh, code by Steve. Z. Code okay, so you can also follow uh, Steve on Twitter. It's code by Steve Z. And uh, he's the lead architect on Nucleus here. So make sure to follow Steve, follow Brent, follow myself, and then let's put the uh, final information here. We're going to wrap up the webinar. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. We will have more webinars in the future around Nucleus. Some of them will be more about native development. Others will also be about Monotouch itself. If you want uh, specific areas to be covered in future webinars and blog posts, please let us know. Best way to reach us is either via the forums on the product or uh, on Twitter as well. This is one of the best ways to interact with us. So thank you very much for joining us today. Wishing you a great day and uh, happy coding to everyone.